Amen. Thank you, Jesse and Emma, for such a beautiful song. He's resurrecting me. I tell you that. I'm looking forward to when we get to the part on the empty cross to really celebrate that this morning. But it's time for us to go into the Word. I want you to grab your Bibles and make sure you keep your Bibles with you because I want to read a couple of scriptures that I think are going to be paramount for what we're going to be sharing this morning. We are in part two of this series on Meet Me at the Cross. So before I go into the Word this morning, just grab your Bibles. Uh, let's look to the Lord for a word of prayer that the Holy Spirit would just speak to us this morning and open our hearts to read, uh, to understand, and to receive what He has in store for us. Let us pray this morning. Holy Spirit, you are an awesome, you are a powerful, you are a phenomenal God, Lord. In spite of what it feels and looks like on the outside, God, with the snow coming down like crazy, your people can sit in the comfort of their home in front of their televisions or computer screens or cell phones and worship you together as a corporate body of believers, Lord. So uh, I thank you for that, Lord. You revealed in my spirit today, as Pastor Katani and I were sharing earlier, um, in the service, God, that though we are apart, we are still together. And so you've made that way possible, God, through the advent of technology. So we don't take that lightly, God, that how you prepared this ministry to still have the body participate. But as we go into the Word and we look to what you have in store for us today, let us just reflect on your grace and your love and your mercy for us, God, in, in providing this cross so we can have access to you. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Um, let me begin by saying this. Um, we're in the series Meet Me at the Cross. And last week we spoke briefly about um, part one, which was the need for the cross. And I'm going to encourage you. I had a chance to watch my wife last night re-engage the sermon and listen to it. And I want to encourage you all, do the same thing. Get that word in your spirit and get it over and over again, I think the Lord really laid some foundational things for us last week. Here's what we shared. We shared three things with you last week. The key passage was Romans 5 and 12 through 14, where we saw as by one human or one person, sin entered into the world and death by sin and death passed upon all because all of us have sinned. And the first thing we saw as we looked at that passage um, in front of us last week is that we notice that the depravity of human being mandates the need for the cross. What we learn from that is that all of us are sinners, all of us are depraved. And we saw in Psalms 51 and 5 where David said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So here's what that means, people. By default, we're all sinners, okay? There, there's sad news in that, but there's good news that I'm going to be sharing with you for the remainder of the message and throughout the entirety of the series. The good, there's good news there. We are depraved. We're, we're sinners by default, right? We, when we looked at that, we looked at how sin entered the garden uh, in the Garden of Eden um, because of the choice and the decision that the first man and the first woman made, and we saw that extensively. But then here's the second thing we shared with you yesterday, right? Depravity is not or does not excuse us from our individual responsibility for sins, right? If you listened to the message last week, here is what you heard. We cannot use the excuse, the devil made me do it. We cannot use that excuse. The choice is on us, and we have the choice to listen or, and to, to give in to temptation or to say no to the temptation. His job is to tempt. Our job is to not give in to the temptation. Our job is to obey God. And so we saw in James 1, right, verses 13 and 14, that none of us have the right to say that when we're tempted that God is tempting us because God does not tempt with evil. That's not his M.O. That's not who he is. We have to take individual responsibility for sin. And here's the third thing we saw, right? This is important. The cross of Christ, it absolves humans from the penalty of sin. I'm going to say it again. The cross of Christ absolves us all from the penalty of sin. Here is what that means. Because of the cross of Christ, we 
can be um, reconciled to God, right? We can be brought back into a right relationship with God. And that is what the cross of Christ did for us. And we saw that in Romans 5, um, verse 18, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22, where it talks about, you know, how because one man sinned, by, um, it spread through the world, but then through the second Adam, through one man, right? Um, um, grace, salvation, now enters the earth realm, and we have access to God. So I want to pick that up. I want to pick up that concept today, and, and today we're going to be very simple, so I need you to, to listen in today because what's happening today is I'm really setting up the message for what we're going to be talking about next week. Okay, I'm going to say this to you. You don't want to go to heaven before you hear the message next week and the following, um, for the rest of the, the duration of the series. It's juicy. It's going to be good. But today may seem just a little, it's, it's just information. I just need to give you information on what God did so we can get to where he would have us to go. So the first passage I want to share with you this morning is found in 1 Corinthians um, chapter, what is that? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18. I need you all just to go there real quick. Let me read this. Uh, every week I'm going to try to have a cross scripture that potentially would be helpful for you. This one today kind of sets the tone, right? Listen to this, depending on your translation, here's how it reads. For the word of the cross, or some of your translation, if it's King James, the pre preaching of the cross, if it's the NIV, it's the message of the cross. For the word, the preaching, or the message of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But listen to this. But to us, and I love that word, us, who are being saved, it is the power of God. Oh, my goodness. I, I need you all to put hallelujah in those chats and say amen. If you have been blood bought and blood washed, the message of the cross is foolishness to people who are perishing. So they're probably saying, what's with this meet me at the cross thing, right? But for those of us who know Christ as the Lord and Savior, Grandma and Dad used to put it this way, in the pardon of our sin, it is the power. There's power there. My goodness, and we're going to talk a little bit about that on this morning. But now, as we look at, at the focus today, which is going to be the journey to the cross, here is one how I want to pick up. So go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, and you might have heard the question I asked Pastor Tani, and some of you may have agreed, some of you may not have agreed, but we'll talk about that a little bit. I think she was on to something. And go to Genesis chapter 3, and I want to jump down specifically at, um, what verse is that? I want to look at this, um, let me see here, verse 21. I want to talk about verse 21 to kind of set up what happened. Here is what you need to know about the grace of God as we talk about the journey to the cross. We saw last week that the cross was needed because I sinned, because you sinned, because Adam sinned, because Eve sinned, and because sin now has entered the world. And so all of us, our default state, be it omissively or commissively, is the truth that we sin. And what I meant by those two words is sometimes we sin knowing that we're sinning, and sometimes we sin not knowing that we're sinning. As a matter of fact, 1 John, right? 1 John puts it this way in 1 verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So here's what happens. Here's what happened in the garden. Let's, let's begin there and work our way through. Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed God. They were defiant. They chose to follow the advice of the enemy, and they sinned. Notice the grace of God, right? Look at, at verse 21 in chapter 3, verse 21. Here is what it says in verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of sin and he clothed them, okay? Now, now you, you've got to lock into this. God told them don't eat from the tree. Don't touch the tree. They messed up. Yes, there is consequences for the sin, but the point I want to make and where we're going to go today is that in spite of the choice that they made, God took the initiative 
to commit the first sacrifice. He killed an animal, and I find this to be humorous. He gave them some leather garments, right? He clothed them, or let me use a word that you can identify it with. He covered them, okay? They sin, but God covered them. Oh my goodness, I hope you're getting this. They sin, but God covered them. The reason I like that, and the reason I'm hoping you appreciate that as well, is that the cross is here because we sin, but what we're seeing now in the second part of this series, that in the midst of our sin, because of the love of God, oh my goodness, somebody needs to say hallelujah, God covers you. In other words, here's what he does. He provides a way. He provides a mechanism. He provides a pathway for a restored relationship back with him. So here's this. The cross then was introduced because of sin into the world, right? Now here's where I want to pick up and here's what I want you to see. Listen to this statement. The, the, the serpent was instrumental, right, in, in undoing the woman, in undoing Adam and in undoing Eve. But listen to this. Um, but you got to hear this part. Um, but in turn now, the woman, she ultimately brings down the serpent through her offspring. So listen to this. God covers... And then God is issuing, um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? He is issuing what he's going to do to, to either the con to, to suffer the consequence of sin, but then he talks about how he's going to restore a relationship back with man. So look with me now at Genesis 3. Back up to, back up to verse 14. This is shortly after they sinned, right? We know that God covered them in the end, but look at verse 14. He's speaking consequence to the serpent, and here's what he said. And God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you will go, and thus you shall eat all the days of your life. Now look at verse 15. This was the question that I asked Pastor Katani. Look at verse 15. Here's what he said. I will put now enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And notice what he says. He will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. I'm going to read that again because I want to point out a word that I want to spend some time on. I will put enmity between you and the woman and depending on your translation, if it's King James and New King James, and between your offspring or your seed and between her seed, and he shall bruise your head, but you shall bruise his heel. Now, the purpose of today's message is not to spend a lot of time talking about um, the etymology of the word bruise or what's really happening in the text or what, 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 what God is really saying is going to happen to the enemy or what's not going to happen. But there's a couple of things I want to point out in the text that's being implied in what um, that, that gets to, to begin the, for us to understand what the journey now is to the cross, right? Who is it that's going to make it to the cross? And the thing that I want you to see, a couple of things in the text. Number one, he says, I'm going to put enmity. Now, all of a sudden, there is this huge chasm. There, chasm. there is this huge divide. There is this tension that exists between uh, the people of God and the enemy, right? There's enmity there. There's this divide. There is this chasm. There is something that has been broken. There is something that has been wrong. But then What's even nuanced in the text, and this is the question I asked Pastor Gatani, where he says, I, I will put enmity between um, you and the woman and the, between the offsprings, right? And her offspring is going to, to bruise or crush your head, and you are going to bruise his heel. What is really being spoken in the text here? Here, th th there's a lot of conversation, there's a lot of of, of theological debate. There's a lot that's being um, spoken up in this text as, as it relates to what the text really means. But what I want you to take away from this teaching and this passage this morning, notice where I begin. God covered them when they sinned. I began there. He made a garment, and I said this. The first sacrifice was offered, and I also said this, and he made garments of leather, and he 
covered them, right? But before him actually doing that, here is what he said. The seed of the woman is going to bruise your head, okay? Interpret that word however you choose, be it crushed or smash, whatever term you want to use. But the text is saying that something is going to come. Let me back up. Something or someone is going to come from the lineage or from the descendant of the woman that's going to handle God's business and take care of what this enemy did forever. And here's what Pastor Kay said, and I tend to agree with her. There's prophecy being spoken in this text that through the descendant of this woman, here's the journey to the cross, through the descendant of Eve, and I think literally the text was speaking about Eve because she was the first woman on the earth. She was the mother of all creation. So through her descendant, through her lineage, one of her offsprings, somewhere down the line, listen to me, is going to take a journey to the cross, Lord have mercy. And on that cross, they're going to deal with what happened in the Garden of, of, of Eden. Now, don't miss the fact, this is going to happen sometime in the future, but lock into this. Adam and Eve don't have to wait that long because God already covered them. Lord Jesus, I wish, I wish you can see what's happening in the text here. So here's, here's what the text is saying, right? In, in Genesis 3, 14 and 15, we talk about that. There is a Messiah now that's going to be coming somewhere through the lineage or be a descendant of Adam and Eve that's going to provide the, the restoration, the reconciliation, the atonement, whatever it's going to take to bring us back into a relationship with God. Now, let me make a couple of statements, and I want to read a couple of things, and then I'm going to share a couple of passages, then we'll be done with this, because this is just information this morning. You need to know that the Messiah now coming into the world was no secret, okay? It's hinted at in Genesis 3 and 15. It is nuanced there. You've got to dig to see it, right? But, but, but all over the Bible... Here's what I want you to understand. God had already prophesied that this Messiah was going to come. And here's what the seed now, or here's what the descendant of the woman looks like. You know biblical history. I mean, after, uh, in the Old Testament, there is, um, there, there is all these, these patriarchs that were born, right? There were all the patriarchs that were going on. But here's what I want you to realize. When you get to Genesis chapter 12, in spite of Noah and Abimelech and all the people that were there, a lot, all of them, Abraham comes on the scene. Abraham comes on the scene. And I want to make this statement carefully, right? Of all the people that existed on the earth in the book of Genesis. And here it is. They were all from the seed of the woman. Okay? Here's the path now God is beginning to choose. He sovereignly out of everyone that was on the face of the earth, chose Abraham's lineage for which to make a specific path now for the seed to be chosen from through which the Messiah was going to enter the earth. Now, I need to do a parenthetic here. Don't make the mistake into thinking that there was anything special about Abraham. Don't make the mistake into thinking that Abraham was living such a good life. Let me go here. Don't even make the mistake in thinking that Abraham had this extraordinary relationship with God because I'm going to be the guy that's going to say to you, when God called Abraham, question even arises as to whether Abraham actually knew God or not. That's an important statement because a lot of us are disqualifying ourselves from being who God would have us to be because we look at where we are, we look at what we've done, we look at our past, we look at all of that stuff, and we disqualify ourselves from being chosen, called, and used by God. Here's what we said, why me? Here's what we say, why me, right? Why Abraham? There was nothing special about Abraham. Nothing special. Just the sovereignty of God chose him as the lineage and the path through which the Messiah was come. You know, you know, you know Abraham's descendant. Come on, there was Isaac, right? And then there was Ishmael and how it was 
that God sovereignly chose Isaac over Ishmael, right? And then there was Jacob who was married to Rachel. And we know Jacob, once again, it wasn't nothing good about Jacob. Come on, he was a trickster at birth. He was a manipulator. He was a crazy guy. Yet and still, God sovereignly chose him. You can appreciate the scripture, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. Listen, if there's anybody that doesn't deserve to be saved, I'm going to be the first to raise my hand, and you had better be raising your hand as well, because there was nothing good in us that caused God to chose, choose us. So he chooses Jacob, right? And then he changes, he changes, lock this in, he changes Jacob's name at that fight at the ladder where Jacob wrestled with him. Here's what he says. You will no longer be called Jacob, but your name now will be called Israel, right? You see where this is going. And you all notice Jacob had 12 sons. And here's what the sons were called. Listen to this. The children of Israel. You get this, right? And you can also understand it. Each child of those 12 children, each child became a particular tribe. So lock into this. Now you have what's called the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Jacob's name is changed into Israel, and each child leads a tribe, right? And it's through one of those tribes that the Messiah is going to enter the earth realm, okay? And so let me get ahead of myself. I'm just fast forward. All of a sudden, we get to the New Testament. Here's what we find. It is through the tribe of Judah now that the Messiah or the Christ enters the earth. So I wanted you to see the path, and that was a quick version of it without going into all those names, from Eve all the way down to the tribe of Judah, the path or the journey, if you will, that God took to send the Messiah into the earth realm. So the Old Testament is filled and it's laden with prophecies or hints of the Messiah coming into the world. Let me give you a couple of them. Here's what Deuteronomy 18, 15 says, right? He would be a prophet like Moses, right? To whom God said, we must listen. Here's what Micah 5 and 2 says about the Messiah. He would be born where? In Bethlehem of Judah. Here's what Isaiah 7 and 14 said. He would be born of a virgin. You see all the prophecy that's speaking. Here's 2 Samuel 17. He would, be, he would have a throne, a kingdom, and a dynasty or house, starting with King David, that he will last forever. Here's what Isaiah chapter 9 says. He would be called, you all know this one because you hear it every Christmas, wonderful counselor, right? You heard this. Mighty God, you heard this. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Come on, you know this. And he would possess an everlasting kingdom. They said his kingdom would have no end. Here's what Zechariah says in Zechariah chapter 9 about him, right? He would ride into Jerusalem. We're going to see this in a couple of weeks. Palm Sunday is coming. On a donkey, righteous and having salvation, coming with gentleness, right? Here's what Isaiah said. He would be pierced for our transgression. He would be bruised for our iniquities. Come on, y'all know these scriptures. These are prophecy. Here's Isaiah in chapter 53. He would die among the wicked ones, but he would be buried with the rich. Lord, I like that. Here's Psalms. Here's what David says in Psalm 16. He would be resurrected from the grave, for God would not allow his holy one, Lord, have mercy, to suffer decay. In other words, he ain't going to be in the grave long enough for his body to decompose. Here's what Daniel said. He would come again from the clouds of heaven as the son of man. Here's Malachi. Here's Malachi, right? He would be the son of righteousness for all who revere him and look for his coming again. Here is what Zechariah said. He is the one whom Israel will one day recognize as the one they pierce causing bitter grief. You can see why I'm saying you don't want to miss next week's message. We're going to get deeper into it. So all of these prophecies, here's what they do. They build what I'm going to refer to as a scarlet thread woven throughout scriptures. It connects the dots from Eve all the way to the New Testament to show the journey and the path that God chose to send the Messiah into the world to die for us on the cross. 
Now, let me say this, and then we're going to transition to the two scriptures I want to share with you this morning. All the, the entirety of the journey or the plight of the Israelites in the Old Testament are people that God chose, not because of anything that was special about them. He just sovereignly chose them. Here's why he did that. He wanted the rest of the world to see a people who had a relationship with him, a people who served a God that loved them so much, a people who served a God that would be willing to go above and beyond to fight for them, to protect them, to deliver them from bondage, to provide for them. You kind of get where I'm going with this, that the rest of the world would see the relationship they had with this God, and they would get jealous, and they would want to worship him. But you know the story of the Israelites, just like the story, uh, but let me put here, just like my story and your story. There is disobedience, there is failing, there is all of that every step of the way. Yet and still, here's Genesis, God covers. God covers. Isn't it amazing that God has a way of always providing a means of either forgiving, covering us, or just having our back when we blow it? Don't you find that amazing? Don't I find that amazing? And I worship God, and I thank God for that every single day. Now, let's jump forward. So now all of a sudden, the Messiah now has come. The Messiah has entered the world, right? So we made it from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament. And the Messiah now is on the earth doing his business. He is doing what God had sent him to do. He is doing ministry. And if you would grab your Bibles and go over to John chapter 3, there's two scriptures I want to show you real quick. In, in St. John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 3, a very, very familiar passage of scripture that you all know well. A fellow by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus just happens to be a religious ruler. So he was stuck. He is a descendant of Israel, right? He is a Jew. He's one of the chosen people. He is a Pharisee. But he had missed the truth that the Messiah now, he, he, he knew the journey. He knew the Messiah was supposed to come into the world his problem was he did not expect that this Messiah would ever end up on a cross, right? So here's where I want to pick up. So he comes to Jesus by night, and he asks him a unique question. He said, what must I do to be born? Um, to, uh, he says, let me read verse 3, verse 3, verse 1 of chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Right? Watch Jesus' response. So contrary to what Nicodemus expected. He answered him, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That perplexed Brother Nick, right? Now here's one where I want to pick up. Go down to verse 9. I want to pick up right there, and I want you to see what's saying. So Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? In other words, don't you know the journey that the Messiah is supposed to take? Okay, talking about being born again. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we know and hear and witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Verse 12, if I have told you earthly things you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Okay, look at verse 13. Here's the word. He says this. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. And he says this, the son of man. And look at verse 14. Here's where we're going to work. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, he says, So must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. I'm hoping you're seeing the journey to the cross, okay? So, so notice what he's saying. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now jump over real quick to Numbers, because you've got to see this, and then we're going to end. I, I want y'all to see Numbers. Jump all the way to the Old Testament, to Numbers chapter 21. Go over to chapter 21, the book of Numbers, and jump down to um, pick up at verse 4. Let's start there. you got to understand, you must understand 
What happened with Moses in the Old Testament with the Israelites that caused Jesus to make a reference when speaking to Nicodemus because he's saying, Nicodemus, my entire journey was to get to the cross, but you can't see it because you're expecting me to come as something else. So let me read and then we'll wrap this up. Notice what he says. The Israelites now are in the wilderness, right? Here's what it says in verse 4. From Mount Hor, they set out by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God, my goodness, and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord, watch this, sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that the, many of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. And they're asking Moses this now. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery servant, watch this serpent, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses, this is excited, made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would do what? He would look to the serpent and live. Don't miss this. They're sitting on Mount Hor, and they're complaining against God. Let me go here. They're sinning against God. They're messing up. They're blowing it. And God punishes them by sending these brazen, fiery serpents. And, and the serpent is biting and killing them. And they said, Moses, you pray to God that this wouldn't happen, right? And here's what God says. Take a serpent, make a bronze one, put it on a pole, and set it up in front of the people. So when the serpent bite them, here's what they do. All they've got to do is look to it and live. Here's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. I, I hope you get where this is going. The reason for the cross is because we're being bitten by the serpent of sin. And the journey to the cross was that all we've got to do is lift up our eyes whenever that serpent gets us, whenever we mess up, whenever we feel as if we're going to die. All we've got to do is look to the cross and live. I hope you're getting this. Because somebody's feeling as if they can't make it. Here's the journey. Look to the cross. And there's life. Look to the cross. And there's life. Here's my scripture. 1 Corinthians 1 and I'm done. For the word or the preaching of the cross is to those who are perishing. What? Foolishness to those who are perishing. But for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Jesus took that path, the Messiah took that path to exercise a level of power on that cross that all we've got to do is look to it and live. Doesn't matter how much you've blown it. Doesn't matter how much you've messed up. Doesn't matter how much you think that God can't use you. Don't miss everything I've said about him choosing Abraham and the Israelites. Look to the cross and live. Look to the cross and live. Let me pray for you this morning. Holy Spirit, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you're doing. You're a magnificent, powerful, awesome God. Thank you for your word, God. We look to the cross this morning as you've journeyed from Genesis all the way to the New Testament just to get to that cross. So all we've got to do is look up to it. This is David. I will look to the hills from where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, the maker in heaven and earth. Thank you for the journey you took. Because you took that path, I can live. Others can live. So we give this to you. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen.